Hey, hey, hey. Welcome to your weekly Cornish Beatty. It is myself, Nick, joined with Gösta Bucu, PhD candidate in the Department of Political Science at the University of Toronto. That was an absolute mouthful. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, so we are um, we are recording this episode literally the day before the Turkish elections. And um, I thought, I, uh, coincidentally, you released a piece this week on the uh, diaspora vote um, in Turkey, uh, the, in Germany, the Turkish diaspora vote um, regarding these upcoming elections, particularly how the opposition vote uh, headed by, and I'm going to absolutely bird butcher his name. Maybe you can help me with uh, Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu. Yes, yeah. um, and how uh, the 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 German Turkish uh, uh, voters, uh, how how the opposition looks to seek out to swing these voters who have possibly maybe a, a, a bit of a stereotype of being these conservative AKP voters in Germany. They have a very long history in this country uh, that dates back, uh, you know, over 50 years, you know, since the modern German state exists, the, you know, Turkish Gastabaita or, you know, Balkan or whoever came mm-hmm. to Germany and have been a part of the society uh to the you know like or dislike of you know the some German uh, uh, of the conservative German population, but you know I think that we can safely say in 2023 that um, Turkish Germans are very much a part of the modern German face, and um, you're kind of here to dispel some of these uh, these stereotypes and also talk about. Uh, how they are um, not only just transforming the election in Turkey, but also the political landscape of the Turkish diaspora. And I find this personally very interesting, uh, just as someone who is also from a diaspora group that has uh, a bunch of silly stereotypes of being a uh, Greek American. <laughs> and it is um, something that then I always kind of find very much kind of um one tackling some of the stereotypes that then, at least for me, I know that then a lot of the Greek stereotypes, they may be true. I may, you know, joke about that they are, but at the same time, it is far more complex. And I'm really glad to have you on to talk about uh, exactly this. So thank you so much. And where do we start? Where do we, um, like, where do we see the, the, the first large influx of the Turkish diaspora in the modern German post-World War II state? I mean, basically, it all started, uh, as you said, with the guest worker um, migration to Germany, uh, also known as the Gastarbeiter Migration, um, which, you know, basically started a little bit already in the 50s um, with individual people being recruited by private companies and then later turned into large scale recruitment in the 1960s. And that's when um, Turks, together with, as you said, Greeks, Italians, um, and other other groups, uh, you know, came came here to rebuild Germany, and very much under difficult circumstances, right? So the expectation was that these people would leave. Um, in the beginning, many host countries like Germany introduced um, rotation policies. So the expectation was, oh, they're going to do our jobs, and then they're going to leave. But but what happened, as we know, you know, from Berlin in twenty twenty three, is very much different. So. Um, so that's basically how everything started. Uh, and later, um, there was a... I mean, do you want me to continue? Oh, or? yeah, of course. Yeah. Go on. So later there was a Annahme stop, right? So they ended the recruitment because um, because of uh, economic changes. There was the oil crisis. Um, and families re- reuniting. So there was a big discourse around, like, okay, how much can Germany actually handle and then we have this like racist backlash. Um, we have uh, rising xenophobia, both in parliament and uh, the media discourse around Turks as well. Um, are you know so questioning their identity, uh, depicting them as Muslims, as the other. So you know very much also topics that the community grapples with until today. Um, and then the 1990s uh, with you know arson attacks. Um, we uh, the tragic um, or racist attacks in Zollingen and Mern. It's a uh, yeah, it's a very much history that is shaped by you know tragedies and rejection 
and stereotypification. Uh, so I'm not at all surprised that today we keep debating, you know, where the place of Turkish diaspora voters are and why are they supporting Erdogan. And, and, and so these topics are, yeah. Yeah, um, I guess another, like, uh, where I'd want to go from there is then also that um, where did a lot of these people from um, originally, like, where did they come mm-hmm. from in Turkey? Like, what was the economic background of these people? Where were they? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Where, where were they from originally in Turkey to then come that then Germany was seen as mm-hmm. this, you know, promise of a better land? Mm-hmm. Obviously, I, I promise of better land is a bit much because they had to physically rebuild the country in order <laughs> to participate. But it is a very interesting kind of phenomenon that then that, um, yeah, of, of where, where these people all came from. Yeah, I think the general narrative is that these people were, you know, came from rural areas of Turkey, were poor, uneducated, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, um, if you look at uh, immigration patterns from Turkey, not only in the 60s, but you look at the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, you'll see that the reality is actually quite different. So, of course, yeah, the, 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 the guest workers that came were... M- in majority from rural areas, they were in need of labor. Turkey was unable to provide, you know, a workplace for these unskilled people. At the same time, um, there was a issue with foreign currencies, inflation, very much like today. Um, and in a way, these people were recruited in the first place. But what happened after is much more interesting because in the 1970s and 1980s, with the um, coming to power of the military regime in Turkey, um, you see, you'll see that lots of people, I mean, over 500,000, if I'm not mistaken, uh, came because of political reasons. And these pe- people were often leftist, Kurdish, intellectuals, educated people, people who fought for democracy at universities. And they substantively changed the composition of the diaspora in the 1980s. I mean, starting the 1970s, yeah. Yeah, and that's... Um Exactly that movement of people is something that then I wanted to also touch on, of course, is that then you see this, I think, very well. Um, I guess it obviously depends on where you are in Germany and who you interact with. But this, yeah, like exactly like you mentioned, this older Kurdish slash in some cases leftist diaspora that's been here that is very politically involved within um, a lot of German parties. I mean, we see the Greens, SPD being probably the I would I think they're the two largest, if I'm not mistaken, of like Turkish German voters, but the CDU, of course, we'll talk about later. Um, and and Linke. Andy Linke, yeah. of course, also have um, um, pretty much every party actually is is in some way shaped by um, the Turkish community in Germany. But how did these um, groups interact with one another then mm-hmm. when you have this older, um, I mean, yeah, I, I assume it is the generation before of, you know, coming with the original Gastabaita mm-hmm. program and then these, uh, you know, the the political emigrants uh, from, from Turkey into Germany. How do they, um, do they find themselves in the same areas that they're mixing in or do they not really associate with one another at, 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 um, at the beginning? How do they come about, I guess, mm-hmm. amongst each other? So you mean historically, right? Mm-hmm, exactly. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So what happened was, Basically, these people were neglected, neglect, neglected from Turkey, like given up. You know, the responsibility was shifted to the host country. But at the same time, Germany also neglected, neglected these people. They didn't provide any social, educational or cultural um, programs for these people. There were rarely language schools. As I said, right, the expectation was these people will leave. Um, they're not our responsibility. And at the same time, Turkey was like, OK, uh, you're abroad, we will provide you with some consular services when you need some, you know, your visa or whatnot. But that was that. So I, so in my own doctoral research, I also interviewed people about this uh, historical um, development. And I talked to people who then in the 1960s and 70s opened up, you know, their own little private mosques in the back of the building because there, there was no space for them to really pray. They didn't have any prayer carpets. They would pray on uh, newspapers and stuff like that. Um, I think historically there's like really interesting examples of this. Um, I remember coming across a picture of um, guest workers, uh, you know, praying in front of the Kölner Dom um, during the eight. 
Uh, so okay. there's a really cool picture of that, a uh, photograph of that. And so these people were completely abandoned and they had no resources whatsoever and uh, tried to organize, self-organize um, from, from, from below. And similar with the cultural and, and language needs or whatever they needed. So in the beginning, they were very much isolated from German support structures and other allies. And then slowly, I mean, of course, these were workers, right? And Germany has a very strong union culture. So slowly they started to interact with unions. And, and, then, and then when the leftist um, asylum seekers arrived here, I guess that's when really um, organizational activities took off. And that's when we see, you know, first steps of like interaction between German social actors, political actors and the diaspora. Yeah, because these people, at least in as well, the the second round of migrants that came over were also very um, historically well disciplined within their social activism back home mm-hmm. in Turkey. So it was it it does seem like kind of the the, the perfect storm, not storm, I guess it makes it sound like negative, but the, 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 the perfect situation for them of Germany, which has a very rigid, you know, social democracy union activism that exists and them to to i mean still yeah i mean i i think one of the you know just kind of going off the top of my head of where i see people uh uh, you know turkish germans who are most active is 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 actually in like labor activism stuff particularly on local berlin levels especially so um it makes perfect sense that there's this um this like tradition within the activism that they did back and you see a lot of these these organizations, I think, still have connections to groups back in Turkey as well. And we'll see that later with, I forget the party's name that they're, I think they're an offshoot of the HDP, if I'm not mistaken. They're called like Yezi. Yeshil Sol Party. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that very much, at least from what I see, is very much connected to these workers' roots yes. within the Kurdish leftist mm-hmm. movements in Turkey and within the diaspora. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and. Uh, as well too that then you mentioned uh, that the 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 picture of uh, you know these gastabaita praying in front of the Kona Dome. Obviously, we have to address then the sense of what was the reaction then from Germans to these people, of course, because while this visual to me sounds very interesting, I can imagine the um, you know a Germany that is recently coming out of a a very dark period of its history is also probably not very. Uh, looking very kindly onto a predominantly Muslim group of people coming into their country, regardless of, I think, if it is the first wave or second wave or even the third wave, because we can see this still today with, um, I know that, you know, friends of mine who have come over from Turkey recently still experience um, a very, what seems almost like primal version of racism in some cases, because... German. I mean, being from from the United States, I'm very much aware of that racism is, of course, a, an alive and well thing. But in the U.S., it just functions in a much different historical way. And these, like, very, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm 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 speaking too much from an American perspective, but um, I feel that racism is a bit more on the nose sometimes in Germany. That people will tell you things of how they feel or see or you know how uh, about you. And if it is racially motivated, I feel that I see that stuff way more out on the open than I would say in the U.S., which is a structurally much more racist country. Much I'm not going to go compare which country is more or less racist, but still nonetheless, is that then um, Germany has had to deal with a much later, in, quote unquote, integration of people. So how are these people, how has this interaction then changed over the years um, with a very large uh, minority population of the country? I mean, just to go back to your comparison real quick uh, about the U.S. and and, and Europe, basically, uh, I think the biggest problem with why countries like Germany, the Netherlands, Austria, France, um, they all, I mean, they all had a problem with uh, emigration and migration later um, is because of, you know, how homogenous state making was in Europe, whereas mm-hmm. like the, or US, the attempt to be homogenous. or the attempt yeah. to be homogenous. Yeah. I mean, obviously, obviously it's it's a, it's an ideal. It's yeah. it's, it's, it's it's imagined, um, whereas like the U.S. was founded on like multicultural mm-hmm. or like this mosaic or whatnot. But in the end, yes, uh, we see racism in both contexts. However, in Germany, I mean, as you said, because of the past, 
a much more problematic issue. And um, when we look back in history, there's also examples of, you know, guest workers being um, being placed in in buildings that were, you know, 20 years ago used to, you know, host or hold Jews in and then deport them to um, to the to the Katset, basically, to concentration camps. So. And and if you like look at how these workers were treated, I mean they went through uh, ridiculous um, medical tests and whatnot. Their pictures, uh, they, there's there's lots of parallels of like how how these people were treated. So so absolutely um, a big a big a big big issue in Germany in that sense. And I guess the realization that Turks in particular were the other and that. This population would later then become a problem. Obviously, was when they discovered that they were Muslim, right? Mm-hmm. So, because if you look at my grandfather, who was also uh, a guest worker uh, who uh, came to Kreuzberg in the 1970s, um, like visually, he looks Italian. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like nobody, yeah. like nobody would notice uh, yeah. that he's 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 a, he's a, he's a Muslim. So. In a sense, when they discovered that these people had religious needs and they had funerals and they had uh, their eight and whatnot to celebrate, that's when um, I think Turks started to being depicted as the other. Not to say that other groups did not experience yeah, any racism, course. but um, the finger was very much pointed at the Turks, right? Türken raus, mm-hmm. this, this Turks get out, is a, is a slogan from the 1980s and 70s. So. Yeah. So that's where that's where uh, it came from, and 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 how did that then change over time? It changed a little with, I guess, social mobility and 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 as as we just talked about the political and social integration of groups and and people coming to di- into different positions and acquiring different skills and not being workers anymore and their ability to kind of like speak up, but. There, there, is, there are also a lot of like historical continuities, and and you know we are still debating whether, uh, you know, as a Turk you can call yourself a German, right? Yeah, it is. It is a very. I mean, it is. It's one of the most interesting things that I've seen. Of again, um, I find it very weird that there is this difference still. Of you know, I um, I find it interesting how my family, who has been in the U.S. on both my mom and dad's side. Like I'm a second generation American. Mm. I never have had to have this, you know, uh, you know, contemplation of am I American or Italian or Greek? It was always like, well, like I'm American. And then these other things are just sprinkles of, you know, my own cultural identity. But there was never like, yeah, I've never these groups, particularly, yes, because of white Christianity, that type of stuff. You they, you know, yes. Was there prejudice that that that? My parents and grandparents experience, of course, but becoming white was very easy. Mm -hmm. And there is still this thing of, um, yeah, I mean, the other being expressed primarily and you can clearly always see it of through predominantly Islam. Um, And I think on a more modern note, we saw this again when Germany took in a lot of Syrian refugees um, or refugees from Afghanistan, that there is always this attempt to brand then you know, this group that then is trying to seek, um, you know, whether it be fleeing a war or better economic opportunity. Germany is very obviously, of course, still selective on, I mean, we saw the Pegida movement as well. I could very much imagine that then in the 50s and 60s, there was something similar to a Pegida movement of the time. You know, Türkenraus is a, a term that we, uh, I think that you're quite familiar with if you read any German history post-World War II of, you know, the uh, the, the, the reconstruction of the country. But um, another avenue that then I thought would always, is also quite interesting is that then when you have um, eventually after generation of generation people making themselves at home, uh, where do then we see these uh, uh, just, you know, I guess differing groups of the diaspora finding themselves politically um like finding their voice politically in Germany. We talked briefly about the labor movement and how in the 70s that was something that then uh, allowed activism to happen, particularly because of the leftist movements that they'd been in. But there aren't just (laughs) left-wing Turkish diaspora. Um, It is far more complicated. It is also far more complicated, I think, in the sense of that then just because someone votes conservative in Turkey doesn't necessarily mean that they vote conservative in Germany 
which is also a, a very interesting phenomenon, I think. So um, who do we kind of see historically become the like first political parties of Germany to start reaching out and being and recognizing that there is a a populace that is very much German as well as, you know, being unique and and having, you know, their own individual voting wants and needs. I think um, probably it's Social Democrats, right? The SPD, um, which then uh, closely um, f- forged ties with different organizations in the Turkish community, the Turkish Gemeinde, um, the Turkish community here started to form its own umbrella organization after the, uh, especially with Mölln and Solingen happening, the arson attacks and the killings. So, um, so the SPD would be would be the, the the first place to look at, and and that's where we see you know uh, the first uh, figures kind of like appearing, um, but also the Green Party um, kind of like opened up avenues for for immigrants to get engaged in. But I would still say that, you know, it was it was still the exception, right? Like in yeah. the 90s and 2000s, like the biggest figure in German politics that many people go back to would be Cem Özdemir, mm-hmm. um, the Green Party politician and now uh, minister, minister. So Minister of Agriculture, Agriculture. I think, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so these would be the first parties that, that really like interacted. Um, and of course the Die Linke always also had an interest in reaching out to different groups. And then, uh, yeah, well, CDU, CSU, um, very much dominance demonstrated an antagonistic stance to migration in general, but also kind of like, um, you know, not rejecting Islam, but really there's been a to. weird push from the CDU recent, at least, at least from what I've been, been seeing that then the CDU and CSU has been trying to market that, um, very much playing on a very bad stereotype of conservatism within diaspora groups, but really trying to market like, hey, we're the conservative party in Germany. You guys have conservative values, right? You should be a member of the CDU. And it's actually been like maybe not wildly successful, but I've been quite surprised in um, how many at least candidates I see who are um, Turkish German running with the CDU. Um, which again, I, um, it makes sense when you think about it. It's very odd cause it plays, it's, it's weird at the same time too, that this is also the same party that obsesses the most about like clans mm. and has a very like, and a very, is- bars and, yeah, and whatnot ex- or wanting to ban stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And a very Islamophobic, uh, rhetoric, right. but then still, uh, has been trying to, to use that. But one of the weirdest ones that you actually added, um, is the AFD. And could you please elaborate on this? Because I knew that there is that there are a few people that are, um, I think, famous Turkish Germans who are quite um, vocal of their support with the AFD. But it seemed a little bit kind of comical. Mm-hmm. Um, could is it? It seems if if you added this here, there clearly then seems to be at least something that the AFD is pushing towards, or that they have support within. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if the AFD is pushing um, pushing for this, but it is interesting that, and and I think that's that's now like now we are slowly turning to uh, you know the policies and the trans transnational engagement of the AKP regime here in Germany because I think it's more something that the AKP is pushing for, in a sense that the regime, the Erdogan regime, is trying to place people into German parties where they can then lobby German policymaking, right? So because the AKP knows that um, the SPD, the Greens, and the Linke very much attracted people who would oppose an authoritarian regime, correct? Yeah. <laughs> uh, because Might as well get the guys who are a little bit, you know, more keen with exactly. authoritarianism uh, and like like Putin and stuff like absolutely. that. Absolutely. So. so 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 you see interesting figures then ending up in 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 far right parties uh, where then there's this like push for okay let's push the interests of Turkey and I and I, I'm not accusing anyone or oh, any, no, no. any specific candidate here but but um, experts have spoken about this and and there is evidence for for such meddling yeah. uh, from the regime so it is really interesting uh, how and and at the same time if you think about it you know people who vote for Erdogan 
um, or some people who vote for Erdogan uh, also believe in conspiracy theories. Yeah, of course. And I mean, Erdogan himself has a few plays written that are very conspiratorial and <laughs> stuff like that. So <laughs> Absolutely. So, And the AfD is also a big fabricant of uh, conspiracy theories. Yeah. So, so there is a natural overlap of values, a natural overlap that is really dangerous for German democracy, right? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and this doesn't only go for the Turkish community. Um, I've also, I'm also aware that, you know, uh, Russian mm-hmm. um, immigrants also tend to, you know, uh, get lulled into the rhetoric of the AfD. So, so that just seems to be like a collection, a, a collection place for, people who reject yeah it seems democracy. like that then that the afd just being in this like grand collection of like this attempting to still live on the like internationalist nationalist thing it it seems a bit like that but they are a bit i like at least to me and i would assume you as well they still seem like a bit kookier than say um i don't know like the cdu i always felt had this this pull with that type because there is there have been again i'm not accusing anyone as well but there have been um allegations of people who have been active members of like organizations like the gray wolves who are also active members of the cdu csu um also weirdly enough in like you know green parties in sweden so it's just like there are political actors all across then um you know diaspora politics that then are obviously I don't want to say like pushing two agendas, but clearly have uh, uh, interests of the regime uh, 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 as well as their own stance in Germany as well. I can, I mean, I can definitely see it. And like, like you said, there are, there's definitely speculation and some proof that this does exist. And I would not hold it against, I'm sorry, the AKP to attempt to do something like that, even organized um, just of all the shady stuff that then is, come out but i guess that that's a perfect transition then from um where the diaspora kind of historically sits um into then where we're seeing then this transformation today within the politics around the turkish election um historically it has been that erdogan has typically relied on the turkish german vote uh because of again some of these things that then that we've that we've mentioned like racism you know xenophobia islamophobia are things that at least i've even noticed that erdogan clearly uses to get their vote in the sense of oh okay well you're treated this way in germany this and that that i recognize this Mm -hmm. and so how effective has has his tactics maybe not just this tactic alone but how is erdogan and the akp and this sort of um more conservative wing of Turkish politics affected the diaspora in the past? I mean, so there was always a conservative, um, pious, nationalist segment within the diaspora that has supported um, conservative or far-right or right regimes in in Turkey. But of course, when Erdogan comes to power, um, the situation is a little bit more different, right? By that time, in the 2000s especially, um, before diaspora voting was a, was a thing, um, you know, Erdogan very much sold himself as this democratic figure of hope. Although, like, the could, West loved him. The West like. loved him, and they pushed him, and they supported him. And to be fair, in until 2007 or so, uh, the policies that Erdogan pushed were quite progressive. But you still always had this question at the back of your head. You were like, oh, I don't know. Like, can we really trust him? And he very much uh, relied on class and identity cleavages in Turkey when he came to power. So like selling himself as this like humble man, you know, uh, from this poor neighborhood of Istanbul, having made it to politics, the outsider. Now he's the insider. And he's going to bring bring about change in the country. And at the same time, kind of also protecting uh, his Muslim brothers and sisters. So that very much mattered on the domestic level in Turkey. But this also played out abroad when then um, diaspora voting uh, laws were uh, reformed in 2012. And with the first, uh, in the 2014 elections, I believe, um, the diaspora was able to vote for the first time. And of course, in the beginning, it was a little bit, um, amateur, right? Like the consulates and representations were not set up for this. 
and participation rates were quite low. But over time, uh, voting participation rates have gone up to 50%, which is quite high for, you know, uh, voting from abroad. Um, so that really worked, worked, worked well for him. And the pool was then very much to, okay, Europe does not want Turks in the European Union, right? At that point, we had reached the point of like, okay, for some reason, um, European policymakers are blocking Turkey from entering and they're coming up with these different accus communicataires, opening up different um, chapters and and Cyprus and whatnot. I mean, you're Greek. I don't have to explain this to you, but like <laughs> yeah. opening up Cyprus is like op- opening up a black hole. Yeah, of So course. really, um, yeah. So so that very much, I think, resulted in uh, the, the diaspora, or, uh, ge- just speaking more generally, to, to a point where they were like, you know what? If you don't want us, we don't want you. And now we have Erdogan. And he is great, and he's the strong man, and he's, he stands up for us, and he talks directly to Merkel. And, you know, and so that had a very much a huge effect on people here, I would say, in the diaspora, not only here, I mean, all over Europe. Um, and at the same time, he also was this conservative, pious man who defended, you know, um, the cultural religious rights of the diaspora, at least in rhetoric. Not that much has happened in terms of policies here, actually. (laughs) But um, at least in rhetoric, it was very much uh, playing, playing, playing this uh, playbook. And it it really worked, worked well for him, I think. And people still treat him like a star. Yeah. Oh, I see his signature on people's car, like everywhere around here. It's, it's, it's definitely something. I mean, I, I thought that the, like, I, I guess I can understand to the sense that, like, okay, because Ataturk is, like, the modern creator of the Turkish state. Regardless if I find the cult of personality a bit odd, I can at least, eh, I don't know. I can understand how someone from that, you know, who who grew up in Germany with this, you know, identity could at least get onto that. The Erdogan one, though, is a bit odd because it just seems like they're trying to create that personality a around counter reality him. yeah and i just the thing i'm always curious of is what has erdogan like like erdogan promises all these big things i mean his his yeah like he has he, he talks the talk but what if the, you mentioned that there hasn't actually been much change in particularly like religious rights and stuff like that um is it mostly just show or does he actually provide things that then that People, whether I guess whether it be in Turkey or the, or, or the diaspora, or is it just continuously just the same promises? I mean, what he what he did in in material sense was really, if you look at Berlin, for instance, the Turkish embassy was completely mm-hmm. rebuilt, and now is this like massive, beautiful building in Tiergarten that just looks amazing from the outside, right? And at the same time, there he also. Um, co-led and co-financed, I believe, um, different mosque projects in, in in Germany. So there's this like huge Vitip mosque in Cologne, for instance, that he then came and opened, right? Mm-hmm. So Turkey's religious um, authority, the Anet, very much, um, you know, went through reforms under Erdogan. And I think a lot of state resources were invested. So you would also see that in the the diaspora you know with imams being uh, paid more properly and um, the services provided by mosques that were um, led by turkey or tied to turkey you know being uplifted so it it did i guess for it for the pious and the um, nationalist segment that goes to the mosque it did make a difference they've also become far more politically active these uh these organ uh, the biggest one you just mentioned as well i just forgot the name yeah yeah Mm -hmm. um particularly in berlin and nav in areas like this where there's a large uh there's a large turkish diaspora they've been very influential as well in influencing very conservative politic very pro akp Mm. uh politic and and if i'm and, and tactics as well of of getting people together to you know rally the vote around Erdogan and i think that they're an organization that then we do have to maybe address as well that then has has um has been very yeah has 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 been a key key political factor within at least the AKP's goals 
uh, within Germany. Absolutely. I mean, uh, the AKP has built different um, or rebuilt and empowered different institutions that already existed in the diaspora and has also um, opened up new branches abroad, like the Union of International Democrats is one organization that works very, I mean, according to, to the people I interviewed on this topic, um, is an organization that works closely with DTIP and there is evidence all over the place in the German media and also by experts that show that then these um, mosque associations and organizations have been used for election uh, campaigning purposes and also spying yeah. on dissidents, right? So there has been a huge spying affair in Germany um, where different lender governments who had contracts with DTIP in offering religious education to uh, Muslim students were put on hold because of this. I mean, there were there were different court cases ongoing. I, I believe in certain Lenda um, governments, there's still, uh, in Lenda courts, there's still some ongoing litigation on this. So nobody's really sure where to put DTIP right now. Yeah. And at the same time, as much as, you know, DTIP's services maybe been expanded... The whole controversy around DTIP has had a really bad impact on the making of German Islam, right? Yeah. So, you know, there there was this attempt of having an Islam conference, um, which which then, uh, you know, culminated in different projects. But in reality, Erdogan's meddling has harmed people here rather than it, it, it helping it, right? How has that then um, affected maybe then younger people of the diaspora's relation to their religion then in that regard saying i mean this is maybe a little bit off the wall because it could be just personal to the you know individual mm. who is experiencing it but um, i could imagine that then creating some strife if you have younger generations who um, particularly are growing up in in a in in bigger cities in germany where there are the turkish diaspora is concentrated in metropolitan areas typically in germany um, is there a, a clash here or are they actually quite good then in offering then educational services as well to, you know, uh, because, you know, depending on how conservative someone is, their upbringing within, you know, the church or the mosque is quite integral. I know for myself, I very much had a, a religious upbringing. Um, how is that then affecting then younger um you know, say second or third generation mm -hmm. uh, Turkish Germans who are then being exposed to this quite conservative out view, uh, outlook, mm -hmm. or is there a pushback, or is it really not something that we can truly see quite yet because it's mm -hmm. too early? But they've 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 been active for a few decades now, if I'm Absolutely. not mistaken. Yeah, I mean, obviously this is this is just an observation. Yeah. No comment I'm going to make because I I haven't done research on this, but. What you can see is that there are clear divides and that these divisions are growing among um, Turkish-German youth or youth from Turkey, I want to say. Uh, because, yeah, there is there is a certain segment that, that that gets pulled into these communities and very much feels at home and feels okay in partaking in different ac activities with these organizations. But at the same time, there are also other youth groups who you know feel left out or feel discriminated by the German state and would like to seek shelter or would like to be seen by their home states but cannot really partake in these activities because you know they may be conservative but they hold different ethnic yeah. and, uh, and racial identity that just doesn't make it possible so so there's there there are huge huge divides among German youth German Turkish youth I want to say in terms of where they can really go and who they can connect with. And I think it really depends, you know, on, on your family, on the upbringing and whatnot. So that's a very uh, complicated matter. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. I, it's just kind of interesting because I'm thinking in the sense of that we live in Berlin and one of the aspects I feel that then a lot of people don't realize that then makes up a large part of the youth culture, particularly like popular youth culture, is... Um, whether it be Turkish or Arab or whatever, you know, diaspora group that then how they, how the youth 
um, kind of go about their lives. You can see it mm. in every part of town, practically, if you don't live in Mitte, yeah. you know, uh, which is, which is, uh, yeah, just something that then I was thinking of is that then how do maybe mm. like these younger people who have mm. been, who've grown up in a quite culturally diverse place, whether mm. they, they too can also, I feel, wear their culture on their sleeves as well in yeah. some regard that maybe then the generation before them mm. wasn't as open to, mm. has maybe there is more, um, yeah, maybe there is a reaction that then that, you know, like, like just to ask it, but yeah, no, we, we, I, I would imagine the evidence not being very concrete no. in something like that, but it would just be kind of interesting, like of curious of what the overall feeling is amongst them, because I feel that yeah. then like, um, you know, again, these aren't like political monoliths in any way. No. And it's very interesting, at least in the thing I see of a lot of groups that I guess we'll talk about as well that have have appeared up in the in the diaspora as well that do wear their culture on their sleeve very much but then are also very much anti AKP anti Erdogan um, not always necessarily in a like in agreement with one another of course either there is no there's there's this isn't some magical harmony of pro anti Erdogan there's a lot of complexities um, I feel that then I shouldn't even really be using the term Turkish diaspora I'm just meaning Turkish in the sense that they are from the greater Turkish Anatolian area. Exactly. Maybe, because, maybe we can make that clear that yeah. when we say Turkish German, we actually mean populations from Turkey yeah. and, and, and trying to be really inclusive. Yeah, because there are, uh, I mean, there's of course plenty of people who are Kurdish. I would imagine also some, um, you know, uh, you Yazidi, know, Armenian, Armenian Yazidi. and, you know, all these groups of people that then are, that then are mixed in there. Uh, also, I would imagine to don't get along sometimes amongst each other in Turkey as well. But um, needless to say, there is this this group of of the diaspora that then has become more vocal, as you've also mentioned in your foreign policy article, mm. of, uh, you know, who've kind of made their, um, you know, statement being that taking on a very anti-Erdogan stance. This has existed, though, for quite some time, um, as you've also mentioned. This is nothing new. However... Uh, there's also a new group that then is being added to added to the diaspora. I I wouldn't necessarily call them diaspora. Just these newer migrants from Turkey, mm. who because of laws in the countries, they're allowed to vote in Turkey as well, and they're also getting politically involved as well. So, what is um, how 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 do we get from then the '70s groups of these activisms to then? you know, Gezi Park and the, um, I guess you could, I, you can use the overarching analysis of Turkey's pride demonstrations and so like that the anti-LGBT movements and stuff like that, that Erdogan's been taking on that has led to a lot of people leaving the country. How do we get then to the point where we're actually considering that this group is big enough to have a major influence on the Turkish election? Because previously this wasn't as much the case. It was always assumed well, the German Turkish votes going towards mm. Erdogan in some ridiculously high number or not, but mm. um, yeah, like what what brought us to the point where then that we are now having this conversation? <laughs> and you wrote an article uh, earlier this week about about it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Turkish opposition was always present in the diaspora. I would I want to say, um, as I said earlier, right in the nineteen seventies and nineteen eighties. Uh, we have this opposition to the military regime and later, uh, you know, political opposition or mob diaspora mobilization because of the atrocities committed against Alevi religious groups or uh, the Kurdish uh, population in the 1990s. Um, and I guess the biggest reason why we didn't see this in previous elections is that these groups have learned Right. Ever since uh, diaspora voting was allowed in the diaspora um, and different political parties were able to open up representations, these people who were previously loosely, you know, networked and aligned in their opposition to uh, growing repressive tactics of Erdogan, then all of a sudden came together and, and started to organize, right? Like Gezi marks the first moment or momentum where people came together in the streets of Berlin or Cologne or uh, London or Paris. And then they thought, okay, well, there is, we are actually many and we, we do have a voice and we can show our solidarity. But at that time, uh, I want to say 
the mobilization towards the homeland, uh, towards Turkey, was very much periodic and topic based. So you know, when there was an attack in 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 southeastern Cur- uh, uh, Turkey, um, the Kurdish groups would mobilize. Right when something happened, because uh, towards towards the Alevi population the Alevi community in Germany would mobilize and go out in the streets. But Gezi was really the first time when people were like, okay, we are united against this autocrat. But at that time, there was no political consciousness. And I think people also did not know that the diaspora vote could matter so much. And then over time, with the constitutional referendum in 2017, which you know was a significant push of the Turkish political system towards autocracy and equipping... Um, the, the office of the president with so many powers that now we see uh, how much they can be abused by one person. <laughs> Example, Erdogan, <Yeah>. right? <laughs> so Yeah, we are, we, are, we are doing this episode for the, exactly this reason. Of, exactly. Uh, so so that's, and, and I think that's when we really see this like united mobilization of different political parties, the Jumuriyet Halk Party, the People's Republican Party, the Halkland Democrat Party, the pro Kurdish HDP, um, etc., kind of like organizing abroad and uh, campaigning here on German soil, right? So this was this was quite new, and I think the and I think it also surprised Germans and the German media, um, you know, seeing these people out in the streets opposing Erdogan, right? Like in the beginning, it was very much like, oh, Turks are supporting Erdogan; they're going to the rallies. I mean, for instance, the bit set or the bit (laughs) would cover it like that, right? But over time, um, you know, you'd also see coverage on like, okay, but there's also a huge crowd outside of the hall demonstrating against Erdogan. So that really uh, started to make a difference. Um, and And I also know from my own research that, you know, these people have been working, you know, for a really long time and under the radar and trying to organize and trying to recruit new members for the political parties. Uh, so then, you know, you, they could also vote to vote Erdogan out. Yeah. How is then um, in this regard, because, again, this election has, has um, as you mentioned, been the first real push that we've seen from the diaspora where uh, they could become a big force against Erdogan. How is then there? I mean, Maybe not to harp too much onto this, but there's been a few like bad interactions between both sides as well, whether it be intimidation tactics. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if I'm not even mistaken, like two like really bad acts of violence. I think someone even like murdered a work colleague, if I'm not mistaken, recently. A friend told me like that. It's, I mean, I don't know if this is in Germany mm-hmm. or if this was in Turkey, but um, the election is an incredibly serious thing. It isn't. I mean, it's it's. It seems that then that um, like what have been then um, tactics that then have been used that then maybe to to deter Mm. people from going out to the polls? Because that's been something that then I think that we've seen a few accounts of as well of kind Mm. of bullying at the lowest regard and in some regards, you know, full blown intimidation tactics. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Turkey is, um, I think, the world's most notorious perpetrator of what is called transnational repression so basically the act of repress or the use of repressive tactics against dissidents and opponents of, of a regime among authoritarian regimes right after china right mm-hmm. so this year this was a freedom house report um, that just came out in 2023 showing that turkey is second and it is really concerning because germany is you know one of the countries where Turkey is most active in kind of like um, following, persecuting and attacking and coercing uh, members uh, of the of the opposition and dissidents and people who basically just speak up. Um, Germany is also, as you said, has become um, the number one destination for journalists, intellectuals and um, fed up youth who you know want to escape Turkey or have to escape Turkey in order to survive. And, of course, the long arm of the state doesn't stop at the borders of Germany, especially if one has already, you know, structures like DTIP and other kind of groups that then can operate on behalf of the regime. So, I mean, Turkey has been using different tactics from harassing um, 
campaigners, electro campaigners on the street, verbally or physically, um, gender based violence against women activists, um, targeted attacks against um, Kurdish organizations, targeted attacks against Alevi religious institutions um, are quite regular and also digital repression. So like, you know, people are have been regular members of the diaspora who, you know, I don't know, send out a tweet and say Erdogan is a dictator, have been harassed at the Turkish border, have been arrested. Yeah. So it's not even, it's not only uh, high ranking figures in the diaspora, it's also, you know, regular people who just don't support Erdogan, who then have to pay the high price of having, you know, send out a tweet or... How how has the German state has has the German state been like culpable in this? Because there have been a few cases where then Erdogan has I mean, stupidly I think, um, you know the very, um, regardless if it was anti Erdogan or not, the really racist poem speech thing that Jan Böhmermann did mm-hmm. triggered a very bizarre law that Erdogan tried to sue him for. I think it was just you can't make fun of a you can't make fun of another country's leader or something like that. It's mm-hmm. like in the German constitution, yeah. but that's one example. <laughs> but has has the Turkish state then been um, has German have have German authorities also allowed Erdogan to get away with this type of or not even just get away with, but been a tool in him to um, bully or you know intimidate whether it be political opponents or just everyday members of you know even people like you said who aren't high up activists or social leaders within the diaspora mm-hmm. of um, doing things like I know that then uh, Bavaria is a notorious example that they're very um, adamant on the Bavarian state's relationship with the AKP's regime to where like I think if I'm not mistaken we did a thing where the Bavarian police was collecting evidence on Kurdish groups Mm -hmm. to the point where then they sent an arrest warrant out for a guy because he it put all right wait it put Jeremy Clarkson from Top Gear into a terror watch list because a guy that they were watching was a big Top Gear fan (laughs) and they I guess the German police's system didn't separate the two so it said that Jeremy Clarkson was a PKK supporter (laughs) (laughs) okay well yeah, I mean, I mean, regardless of a silly thing like that, how have I mean, yeah, like like yeah. exactly that. Then the 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 intimidation, particularly of Kurdish activist groups, by then you know declaring them as terrorists. Or there's obviously then the PKK. There's obviously then Erdogan has the the Gulen movement that he particularly is not fond of. Um, how does uh, Germany, a country that then also recognizes some of these groups as terror organizations? Um, how do they assist in this, um, mm-hmm. you know, these the, the bullying particularly? Mm-hmm. In, in a lot of cases, probably minorities as well in mm-hmm. Turkey, too. Mm-hmm. But, I, I mean, political repression aside, the, the, the German government seems to be very fond with helping Erdogan mm-hmm. uh, from time to time. Yeah, I mean, like, the complicity between the Turkish and the German state, as research shows, goes back to, you know, the 1970s, yeah. 1980s, 1990s. So there has been a lot of cooperation between these states and the secret services of these states have also cooperated regularly on matters. And I think this has been a continuity until today and sort of like explains why certain groups are still being repressed by Germany and Turkey as well. Um, but at the same time, of course, uh, Germany's stance towards the Erdogan regime has been quite mixed Mm-hmm. In a sense that, like, there have been selective bans of certain things, like, ha- you know, I guess after the rallies, uh, like, where Erdogan stood in front of thousands and hold a, uh, held a speech accusing, I don't know, I don't even remember what he accused who of, but using these different rallies to, you know, woo the diaspora and, and get the vote have been banned um, by the by by different lender governments or through you know private requests or whatnot. So, but overall, there has been a weird selectivity in in ignoring certain topics and prioritizing others. Like for instance, France has banned the gray wolves. Yeah. Um, Germany hasn't done that yet. It's and also it's like still, one of the largest organized uh, gangs in Germany too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and 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 if you look at the Verfassungsbericht, uh, like yeah. the uh, German. Uh, protection of the constitution the organization 
they release reports every year and you can see that they're monitoring these groups. There is surveillance. They are aware that these groups are active and the AKP regime is being mentioned and the different transnational apparatuses are being mentioned. But we really don't know, you know, what what these people are doing, who they are targeting, um, the numbers. I mean, I think there has been like a, a Bundestagsanfrage, like a question in the parliament by, I, as far as I can remember, um, uh, policymakers from Die Linke asking, you know, how many Secret Service uh, personnel is actually active in Germany and, 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 you know, they've released some numbers, but we really don't know what they're doing. So Germany, uh, together with other European host country governments, have be, has been quite dormant on these issues and they haven't, they haven't offered real policies and measures to not only protect people from transnational repression, but also to actively empower the political opposition, yeah. right? So... So there's a big mismatch of, you know, wanting to or wanting to be a democracy, but at the same time, um, really making sure that these groups that are anti Erdogan and pro democratic uh, face an uphill battle, not only in terms of like the Turkish state, but also here in Germany. Yeah. Um, I have one more question before we kind of move on to then the last um, the last piece. I was just as, uh, curious in the sense of how does Erdogan use then these bans of his public speaking for then his benefit here in Germany? Because that's become a very big issue here where, again, Germany will strike a very weird law where they say that, oh, well, a foreign leader can't address... You can only address in person, but you can't address for campaigning reasons mm-hmm. or whatever. They'll pull these weird laws out of nowhere, it feels like, that aren't really... Um, I, they don't very feel, seem very legitimate when you think about it. It does seem at one point, again, I feel that then whenever Germany does something that then is anti-Erdogan, it doesn't really come off as being anti-Erdogan, more so just like anti-Turkish uh, sometimes. And I feel that then Erdogan really probably leans into that too, no? Of that then, hey... You want to see me, don't you? The German government, you know, like, you know, those, the, 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 the repressive German state doesn't want you to be you and to, you know, come and see me live on the big screen. Surely that has to work for a lot of people in Germany to uh, create this sense of, you know, again, uh, like that the German state doesn't want them. They're mm-hmm. kind of in Germany, but they're Turkish, mm-hmm. you know, so Erdo- like that, that, surely that's, that's, that's right up his alley for campaigning. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) I mean, like Erdogan has been notorious for instrumentalizing anything that has been done against him, right? So, um, and and that would be an excellent example of like how he then instrumentalizes these like moments where, uh, you know, he accuses them back as being, I think, I mean, uh, he accused them of being Nazis, right? Like he accused, (laughs) so like, I mean. I mean, you know what? It, it, it's 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 an evergreen insult to the Germans. You know? Yeah, I mean, he was like, "Oh, this works. Let's just use that." I guess. Um, but yeah, but also like, I think that the Turkish regime has also been kind of like tracking Islam Islamophobic events in Germany as well. Like, there has been a website, as far as I'm concerned, that tracks like Isl- Islamophobic events and attacks against the diaspora. So. There's very much interest in using these these well, things as well too. I mean, something that then that well, we're not going to really touch on, but Turkey has definitely doubled down on their influence media wise internationally. With um, is it is it TRT is what it's called the Turkish yeah. uh, the new Radio, uh, television. Uh, I forgot the yeah, yeah it's but, the but it's the new TRT, English TRT. language like it's their version of like Deutsche Welle more or less from yeah. like state media and whatnot yeah. and there's a sometimes you'll see things and it's very whatever you're like okay whatever report about Russia Ukraine and then you'll hear yeah. like a report about like something from the perspective very clearly <laughs> from the AKP's perspective on like uh, they love going off on the Kurds. They uh, the, the, the yeah. TRT's position on that is very clear and, and very problematic. But surely that's also had an influence with Erdogan as well of of maybe not as successfully changing policy mm. um, as say other countries have had with their you know international media outlets. Um, but 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 surely yeah the 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 reach has definitely increased with oh, yeah. the internet and especially you mentioned things like 
whether it be tweets that mm-hmm. then that you can't get in. Also, cyberbullying uh, from the you know pro regime things have also is is I mean, yeah. if you type in Erdogan's name, if you make a tweet, you're gonna have mm-hmm. three people with like you know a Turkish flag come and tweet at you, and sometimes not very nice things, and and you know very very uh, uh, mm-hmm. in some cases harassing people and whatnot. So, um, yeah, it is, it is, um, there was the one last topic that, that I also just wanted to quickly cover before we, before we end here Mm -hmm. was then also the, like this, this composition within then this new, like the new, the new waves of, of, um, workers, Turkish workers into Germany, not Turkish German, but Turks Mm -hmm. into Germany, Mm -hmm. um, and the influence how then, uh, they're forming politics as well, because these are people who are particularly from, um, you know, much more progressive backgrounds, particularly the LGBT community. Mm -hmm. And how are they then um, kind of driving? Also, they are very disciplined in their activism, I've noticed, because if you've gone on any left-wing protests Mm -hmm. since, I would say, probably since I've lived here in 2013, Mm -hmm. um, there have been more and more and more, uh, as as, as you've mentioned too, not even just single-issue Turkey things, but just that the general anti-regime message has gotten larger within... Uh, these these groups and it feels that then also it's taken on a very queer coded message as well too which is of course uh, something that then I always welcome into uh, the discussion but how is this then being uh, treated within then these groups as well are Mm -hmm. they um, finding themselves politically at home in Germany Mm -hmm. but then more or less within more isolated left wing groups Mm -hmm. do they clash with the older diaspora groups Mm -hmm. how is yeah. How is their reality then compared to them, the, the previous groups who've come? Absolutely. I, I'll answer that question. But before answering that, I actually want to go back to, to the disinformation part. Oh, sure actually, thing. If that's yeah. okay. Is oh, okay? absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So you're absolutely right that the media plays a big role in the diaspora as well. I mean, like wherever you go, I mean, even in my own circles, you go to, to a friend's house, the family, ha- family house, the TV's on. Yeah. And it's usually state television and the media in, in Turkey is you know under the control of the regime very much like in Russia you know when you mm-hmm. turn on Russian television or watch Russia Today or something like that you will see you know yeah, specific, very close to a very, Putin yes exactly so 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 that obviously plays a big role in the elder or, or older generations that still watch TV but at the same time there's also a push of kind of like controlling social media spaces not only in Turkey but also using you know, AKP influencers Mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, like have, have a, have a channel to the youth here. So there's like different like influencer kind of people on YouTube, uh, spreading the messages of Erdogan in German to the Turkish German community. So this is, this is also really, really interesting, uh, tool through which, uh, the AKP, you know, gains influence, especially in the younger segments. And that's also quite problematic, right? So, um, uh, and at the same time, there's this like digital repression. So they have trolls. AKP streamers, is what you're saying? AKP and streamers, absolutely, yeah. Oh on TikTok, God. on YouTube, I mean, e- probably even on Twitch. I have no idea, but like, yeah, it's it's crazy. Um, You've now opened up a massive can. I know no Turkish, but I know that I'm going to be going down a rabbit hole of trying to find oh, yeah. all the AKP adjacent streamers. Oh, yeah. I can give you some names later. Oh, yeah. please do. This I sounds will. horrible. I'm already so infatuated by like the apps, like the ones that are in English that are already horrible. I can't imagine then injecting some of like, yeah, some pretty horrible politics that just like right at the front. Uh, is is definitely right up our alley as a as as a show. Yeah. Um, so, turning to your the second question, to, to, yes. the, to the second question <laughs> that you were talking about, like how are the the new Turks or the new? I, I guess they call them like yeah, the new wave. Yeah. Okay. Uh, new wave Turks. Um, how they've been dealing with uh, Germany and 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 how they've been handling their new position in the diaspora. So. These people who arrive from Turkey are usually younger, white collar, secular, skilled people. Yeah, who have arrived or left the country after Gezi, right? Yeah. So Gezi very much marked a big, um, was a big, was a big. Uh, sorry, um, what's it called? 
<laughs> it was a it was a major like political moment. Yeah, for... like a major political moment um, for for people to be like, okay, fuck this, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to stay in this country anymore. I don't really see a future, so I'm gonna immigrate to Germany, Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, or wherever I can find employment. And I wouldn't go as far as, I mean, I wouldn't go and say that everybody who has arrived is political. Yeah. There's also a huge apolitical segment, which I've interacted with, you know. I've people, met a handful of these people as well, too. Yeah, it's very, so, yeah. So I it's mean, very interesting. So they're like, I want to build my life. I don't care about politics. And I certainly don't want to interact with the diaspora because these people are workers. And, yeah. you know, there's also huge stereotypes ab- about Turkish Germans in, in Turkey. Turkey. Yeah, of course. So, so many people feel like they don't belong to Turkey. They don't belong to Germany. And these people who have now arrived in Germany are sort of like often also looking down on um, the diaspora, right? Yeah, they find them like the like at least the interactions that I've had with. Uh, I, th- I think that your description of them being white collar and of a a particular class more often is is a perfect description because yes i think that we see then particularly the what we want to see of the 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 more politically active side but you're absolutely right that there is just like i've i've met people who their general politics are just like yeah whatever i just don't like erdogan but Mm -hmm. that's about it but i also just like don't want to be in turkey particularly the economic crisis is something that then has Mm -hmm. become a a a much more uh, uh has been a factor for people leaving the country mm-hmm. um you know where you have a day-to-day uncertainty of mm-hmm. what your goods cost is definitely a reason of why you would leave and a lot of people typically have family or friends already in germany or one of the other countries mm-hmm. um so yeah and 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 there really is yeah there really is um i've heard from from people that i know that they're like you know uh yeah just some some even amongst like you know they've 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 mentioned that oh yeah we do view like kind of the diaspora as like kind of like this like quasi backwards ish mm-hmm. old fashioned conservative group of people which is very similar to then how you know Greeks view the Greek diaspora I've 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 met Greeks and they're all like I'll tell them of things of just weird family stuff that like happened when I was growing up they're like people have not done that since the 60s and i'm like yeah you're right they shouldn't these are stupid practices they're they're they they are a bit weird and yeah like there there is uh but yeah like there 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 is a bit of 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 snobbishness sometimes that i've i've noticed as well in this regard um but yeah sorry yeah. Uh, go on. but i but i mean they are uh, but, but 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 i've also talked to people who are incredibly political yeah, and of who course. Have, who've immediately integrated into into the new st- uh, the old structures and who are interacting with uh you know a uh, leftist and democratic and, and 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 groups that have been active here in germany uh, in the diaspora since the 1980s so so it's it's a mixed bag i want to say um but it has revitalized um at least the street level mobilization culture and also you know during the observations i've been doing for like this 2023 election is that you know many younger people have also joined the transnational parties and are really active and and supporting and 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 it's it, it has been revitalizing i want to say so so it's a, it's a good it's a good thing oh yeah absolutely and i guess just um on one final note then before we leave is just then what is then like how have we then seen germany more or less do because this is a very interesting thing where i think that if i'm not mistaken the greens have taken up an official party position against erdogan maybe not official but they've at least the turkish community of the greens have come out saying that they're taking an active Mm. anti-erdogan stance um there is a lot of odd reactions from a lot of germans being like oh well you can't do that which a political party can endorse or not endorse a candidate i think this is a very normal thing uh, we see this internationally. It's just not presented often as such. Like, for example, like the Labour Party in the UK endorsed Joe Biden for president. They make an official statement. It doesn't really get like parties are allowed to do this thing. Parties are allowed to then, um, particularly within you mentioned Jem Estimia, who's one of the most notable people uh, 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 within just German politics in general, who is of the Turkish diaspora. But um has there been much other support from then Germany in regards to then 
this opposition? Or has it just been kind of a thing that then like Germans see themselves of like, well, yeah, like I'm anti-authoritarian. I hope that that Erdogan thing, you know, you guys take care of it, you know, good luck. See you next week. Let's see if there's round two, whatever. Or has there been like a, a um, maybe in areas that we haven't seen like a more, uh, uh, you know, coordinated effort mm. amongst political organizations uh, with this community? I mean, it's a hot potato, right? Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, especially for government parties, I want to say, like those part the parties in power, I think um, coming out and taking the official stance is impossible. Yeah. Because of German interests, right? And the biggest interest that Germany has in Turkey right now is to keep refugees out. And there is we this. We have not Turkey, even mentioned that yet. We've not even <laughs> talked about this, but this is this is probably one of the major factors explaining, um, you know, Germans Germany's silence towards many of the issues. But at the same time, it's also kind of a global trend where host country governments are not doing enough to protect yeah. dissidents, not only from Turkey but also. Iran, Syria, Russia, China, you know. And it's so, also just something very interesting, too, with that Germany does this this aspect of um, they they feel that they've absolved themselves of their sins because, oh, we took in so many refugees at the beginning. Well, first off, look at how many have stayed, first off. Second, the entire Western Balkan project that then Mackel was like her like last dying wish was before I leave office, let's at least get that started. Wasn't she even admits there's no economic reason here for the Western Balkans to join the European Union. It is strictly security for migration. So the EU and I mean, yeah, I mean, we can rightfully call it for what it is, but there's the white supremacy that then just exists at, at, at the core of these institutions. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, Germany has been entirely complicit with uh the the you know yeah exactly mm-hmm. this the using people as a bargaining chip for hey keep this guy in power he has a deal that we have made mm-hmm. let's just quiet ourselves because if it ends up in our favor still then we're fine with that you know exactly and that that has very much empowered Erdogan and brought Turkey to to, to the place where it is today um that we have to like you know not yeah not overlook but um, what I want to get back to is really, okay, so so there is this like hot potato and the government parties cannot comment on it. But I've been really impressed by how um, Turkish German or Kurdish German policymakers have come, come out and have, have endorsed this, this stance against Erdogan in their own agenda or what they do in parliament, the parliamentary questions they ask to hold the government accountable. So there is... There, there are people who are actively trying to bring about change, but it's very much punctual. Like, it's, it's, yeah, it's not as effective, and 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 I and and I think it's very much motivated by political interests of yeah. not wanting to step on Erdogan's feet and make him angry. So, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a sad, sad uh, situation. Yeah. But. Well, ending on a sad note. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, um, I mean, I, I, I don't think ending on a sad note because we had a very, uh, a, a very nice discussion of I hope that we broke down some of the stereotypes of this not being a monolithic, only AKP supporting diaspora and that it is much more vibrant. Uh, Goes to thank you so much for coming on. Uh, where can our listeners find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter under at Goes de Boju. Um, and, and follow me. <laughs> I guess that's one way. Um, I'm also publishing on these topics, um, academic and also journalistic stuff. So, yeah. Okay. And I'll add your article as well from Foreign Policy that you released as well earlier Perfect. this week called How Turkey's Opposition Seeks to Swing Diaspora Voters. Um, it is a uh, much more concise view of maybe the last 30 minutes of our discussion. Uh, but thank you so much for coming on. And uh, to all of our listeners, we'll see you next week on Monday. Take care. Perfect. Um, Do you think we can... I just uh, noticed that I'm...